Hi, this is Tracy Clark, author of Broken Places, and you're listening to the Cook Memorial Public Library Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Cook Memorial Public Library Podcast. I'm your host, Nate Goss. Today on the show, we bring you our conversation with Gemma Hartley, author of Fed Up, Emotional Labor, Women, and the Way Forward. Gemma Hartley is a writer, reporter, and author who specializes in the areas of feminism, pop culture, health and wellness, finance, budgeting, and mindfulness. In 2017, Hartley wrote an article for Harper's Bazaar titled, Women Aren't Nags, We're Just Fed Up. The article ended up going viral in a big way. Obviously, Gemma had hit a nerve with many women resonating with her well-articulated frustrations with the imbalance of emotional labor in her household. So she followed up the immensely popular article with Fed Up and was able to dig deeper into the research and flesh out the issue of household gender inequality. For some of you listeners, the term itself, emotional labor, may be new, but don't worry. Gemma gets into what emotional labor is, why women bear so much of the burden, and what men can do to establish more equality in the home. We thought this interview would benefit from having both a male and female perspective, so I was beyond grateful to have fellow staff member Erica O'Rourke join me for this interview. Erica kicked things off by asking Hartley to lay out what emotional labor means to her. So I define emotional labor as the invisible unpaid work that we do to keep everyone around us comfortable and happy, and that includes both mental load work and emotion management work. Could you maybe give us some examples of specific skills that would illustrate both um, the mental load work and the emotion management aspects? Yes. So I originally wrote a viral article, which is why I ended up writing the book. And it talked about how I would have to keep track of, you know, everything going on in our home, remind my husband to do things Um, you know, being the household manager. And then when I had to delegate out any work, you have to do so being very careful of everyone else's emotions, Um, you know, making sure you use the right tone, making sure that everyone feels good about what they're doing, that they get the right praise to keep doing everything uh, while you don't get any of that back. So you're just sort of suppressing your own emotions while dealing with everyone else's. Gemma, why would you say that it's the women who have taken on so much of this mental load, emotional labor? Uh, There's a pretty big cultural expectation that women are going to be the ones to do this work. Uh, We expect women to do a lot of invisible work, especially within the domestic realm. We expect them to be the ones that keep the household running. Uh, to be the ones that really know what is going on with the kids, like what kind of food are they eating this week? What needs to be packed in the backpack? Um, You know, what's the school schedule? And so women are sort of the default for this type of work. I was surprised actually during my research that there was no real natural inclination uh, that women had to do this work. It was Mm -hmm. just the expectation was there and it was there from such an early age. Now, you also say in your book that if you ask the men, they believe domestic labor and child care is split equitably between both partners. And then you actually point to data from uh, the American Time Use Survey that shows men at least aren't entirely off the mark with about a half hour difference per day uh, once you divvy up the labor. So I guess a question that I want to throw to you is in what way are both men and this study missing the point? Yes, I mean... Half an hour a day over a long period of time is definitely going to add up. So I don't think it's insignificant. Sure. Uh, yeah. But at the same time, when we're looking at that workload that looks from the outside very equitable, it's not counting all of the mental work uh, that is going on behind the scenes. You know, before I wrote this book, my husband would do about half of the work in the home, but I would have to ask him to do every single thing that he did. All of these little managerial tasks of the home were not really being accounted for. We're talking in those time use surveys about washing the dishes, you know, doing the laundry, things of that nature, and not so much uh, the tasks that go under office housework, I suppose. You know, as a man reading this, it it was definitely sort of a wake-up call because 
I could easily start going down the list of, you know, all the ways in which I felt I was doing my fair share. I was working really hard to abstain judgment, I guess, and just listen, uh, succeeding uh, most of the time. But sometimes I just kept coming back in my mind to this thought that, you know, hey, I'm a dad. Having kids also upended my life. I'm tired too. So I guess what would you say to those men who may read your book and be inclined to misinterpret what you're saying as men do what you're already doing, but also do a whole lot more? Uh, In other words, how do you preserve our very fragile male egos? (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Well, I will say I don't have a ton of concern for the fragile male (laughs) that is maybe apparent from my book. But I do understand that, you know, this book definitely was written from a perspective of, you know, a woman and is going to speak primarily to the female experience because Mm -hmm. that is my experience. I do understand that men, you know, men feel like they're doing so much more than, you know, especially generations previous. And there are all those stressors on them as well. Um, But I think something important to realize is that when you're talking about your partnership, all of those same stressors usually apply to your partner and then some, and they've just Mm -hmm. been used to taking on all of that. And so I think it's important to not compare yourself to other men in this regard. This was something I think that happened in my marriage a lot, that we'd look at the guys that weren't doing as well as my husband and Mm -hmm. be like, oh, I'll just take on all that extra work because none of the other guys are doing that extra work. And so I think getting to a place of equality really needs to look within your partnership and compare to your partner and not to outside forces, because we do get this idea that uh, we only have to follow what the culture says we need to. Mm -hmm. And that sets a much lower bar, I think, for men than it does for women. Mm -hmm. So it's so interesting that you say that about the cultural expectations, because when Nate and I were talking about this, he'd say, well, you know, as a guy reading this, and I'd be like, well, as a woman reading this, and specifically, (laughs) I found myself um, in the chapter where you talk about these other women who just said, I am handing off this emotional labor. I'm not going to worry about, for example, the birthday party invitations. The husband, alas, drops the ball, and the woman's daughter is sobbing that she missed the birthday party. And even though I agreed, like, ah, why didn't he do that? I was also, like, feeling a little judgmental. Why didn't she step in and do that? Because it broke her kid's heart. And society does tend to judge women a little more harshly. It would be great if we got to a point that society didn't, But until it kind of catches up to the ideas in this book, how do women sort of navigate that tension and how do they handle that feeling? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I remember that interview vividly. You know, um, I really respect Tiffany Dufu and I think it's amazing the way that she has created balance in her relationship. But I remember, you know, both reading her book and then interviewing her for my book and thinking, I could never do this. She has a really strong sense of self-worth that not everyone has. And I don't, you know, that's me being a little bit vulnerable, but I don't have that really strong sense of if I hand this off and it all goes to hell, that doesn't reflect on me. I was much more inclined to, you know, work with my husband and say, I, I really want you to look at why I've you know, created these standards and why I do this emotional labor in the first place so that you have an understanding of why it matters to me and like why it should hopefully matter to you. I really had to up my expectations of my husband and say, you know, I, I know that you're capable of doing this and this really matters to me. And I hope that, you know, that you're going to rise to the occasion. And he did. And I think that made our relationship a lot stronger, whereas I feel like if I had, you know, dropped everything and he had just kind of let it all go to hell, I would have had even more resentment than I had in the Mm -hmm. beginning and no less stress. So really, it was almost like you two had to come to consensus about what those standards were. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't like a clean single conversation, but I think we talked about it a lot. I was really resistant to saying, I'm just going to, you know, have to lower my standards. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, in ways I did, we definitely had a lot of compromise, but a lot of it 
I realized that I had been doing this for so long and I understood why all of this made sense and he didn't, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. it looks from the outside that I just like really like controlling things. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, all of this keeps everything running smoothly. And I know because I have tried so many different ways of doing everything in the home. We had a lot of back and forth about laundry for a long time. (laughs) Oh, you know, we've got three kids and it's a lot of laundry. Yeah, it's a lot of laundry. And I I like doing laundry every day and he was, you know, not on top of it. And we had to sort of come to a consensus on what would actually work for that. So for the men who are listening, um, aside from just the more ethical, hey, this is the right thing to do. Is there sort of a more purely selfish uh, case for why men should step it up and take more uh, of the emotional labor on? Yes. So I, I think, you know, expecting altruism and, you know, being fair in your partnership is kind of hard because that (laughs) does mean you're just, you're just like, oh, well, I'm just giving up my time and my freedom and my privilege. And there, there's not a whole lot about that that is really (laughs) a compelling, I suppose. Yeah. But I think there is a really good reason to step into this, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because I think it makes men's lives better. Hmm. We talk about all of these pressures on women and emotional labor, but there are different sets of expectations for men that they are going to, you know, provide for the family. You think that it's an outdated idea, but it's not. It's something that is still so strongly valued in our culture. They're going to also not tap into their emotional sides too much. There are a lot of taboos still around men really showing up fully for their lives. And I think tapping into emotional labor, thinking about the comfort of others, thinking about nurturing those relationships around you really brings you more fully into your life. And on the home end where you're noticing what needs to be done, doing it right away, Uh, I think that adds so much value to your relationship that you can't even like imagine until you start doing it. Yeah. Um, As soon as my husband really started picking it up and noticing what needed to be done and doing it himself without me asking, I I remember like finding some of my clothes folded and put away and I hadn't asked him to do laundry. And I like I teared up because I felt Hmm. so seen by showing up for the emotional labor in our relationship, he's showing me, yes, I I do see you and I do value you and I do want to be an equal part of this relationship. And that has strengthened our marriage more than anything in, you know, the past 10 years has. Oh, yeah. And I so much of your book is about how this is labor that is unseen, that is undervalued. Um Now, you also early on kind of talk about the origins of this idea of emotional labor. And you mentioned Arlie Hochschild, who originally coined the term in 1983. Um, And she was specifically talking about certain workplace professions that required employees to manage their feelings and put on a happy face for customers, flight attendants kind of being her prime example. Now, since your book's come out, Hochschild has come out and said that while she's happy, people are exploring the realm Uh, She's a little uncomfortable with how the term has become, in her words, blurry and perhaps overused. And I'm wondering if you share any of those concerns at all, especially as you've been talking more about the book or going out and speaking more about it. Yes. So this was an interesting um, thing to have happen. I mean, I I know the Atlantic article that came out about that, and I have mixed feelings about it. Um, I tried to reach out to Hawk's Child during the writing of the book and never got a response. Hmm. Um, But at the onset of writing this book, I had talked to both my editor and my agent about changing the language. And I wasn't totally comfortable using the term emotional labor because of its academic roots and how expanded this version of emotional labor was. Um, I really like the term invisible labor or invisible work to sort of encompass both mental load and emotional labor. But because I had that viral article, which put emotional labor right in the title, um, I did not write that title, by the way. (laughs) The the authors rarely do. Yeah, they don't. And so it was right there. And, you know, I felt that I could 
make a case for the language changing because it had been evolving before that article as well. Mm -hmm. Um, There was Jess Zimmerman's piece on where's my cut on emotional labor in the world. And then there was uh, Rose Hackman, who is also uh, writing a book on emotional labor that will come out next year. Hers had that same sort of expanded definition. And since it was already changing in the culture, I went ahead with the term emotional labor to encompass both that mental load and emotion work. I don't love this whole (laughs) fight about who is using emotional labor correctly. I think Mm -hmm. as long as we are clear on, you know, the terms that we're using, if we want to break it down and talk about specifically mental load and emotion work and separate them out um, and then talk about how they interact with each other, I think that's fine. I think the most important thing is that we're talking about these issues. Um, And I don't have a big concern that using emotional labor as an umbrella term for both of them is going to decrease the value in this conversation. I actually wanted to loop back around. You had talked about, you know, the effect of sort of the rebalancing of emotional labor in your house. Uh, What a boon that was to your marriage. But I'm also wondering... How do you think your attention to emotional labor has sort of affected your children's perception of it? You know, it's hard to tell because they're very young. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping at least that as they become a little bit older, that I'll see these attitudes reflected in them. I have noticed that they'll, they'll go and ask my husband for stuff just as much as they'll come and ask me. And that's a little different than it was before where it's always like mom's the go-to because mom knows what's going on. Mom knows where everything is. Uh, That's not so much a dynamic in our household anymore. I'm hoping that as they get older, they'll really have different expectations as they start to enter partnerships. And what I'm trying as they're, you know, four, six and eight is to really instill these values that our home is our home. It's not my home. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that everyone sort of has to work together to make things work. You mentioned that um, you had had an article go viral, and it was, women aren't nags, we're just fed up. It was, I I read it, and I remember seeing it on, links to it on pretty much every blog I followed. Um, What was it like to have such a personal article go viral? And, And like, what was that like for your husband as well? Yeah, that was a very weird experience. Uh, So I've written personal essays for a very long time, Mm -hmm. but I never really write about my husband. (laughs) I mean, that's not true anymore. But (laughs) until that piece, I had really never written much about my marriage and I had really never written anything critical. And so I had told him that I was writing this piece and you know, how it usually goes on the internet is you write a piece. If it gets some response one day, it's going to be gone the next. Mm. And that was not the case with this. (laughs) It just kept growing. And I remember the day that it came out, I text him and I'm like, hey, did you read over that article that I uh, (laughs) wrote about us? And he was like, no. And I'm like, you might want to because it's got like half a million shares right now. (laughs) And so... It was a little hard. He felt that, you know, oh, everyone's going to think I'm this bad person when they read this. And what I told him was like, no, I think the reason it's going so viral is everyone sees themselves in it and they see their partner in it. And Mm -hmm. no one's really looking at you, Um, which I think is what writing does. It allows like a reflection of yourself. If you connect with a piece of writing, it's because you see yourself in it. Right after the article went viral, I was, you know, signing a book deal within the next month. Hmm. And so we had to have a talk about like, this book is going to be like this article on steroids. There's going to be a lot of dirty laundry in here. (laughs) And uh, he, you know, he was great about it. He said, write whatever you need to write. Don't worry about, you know, my fragile male ego. (laughs) And... (laughs) And he's got some thick skin, let me tell you, because when I gave him part one to read over, Mm -hmm. he made like one note and was like, I think you're a little bit too forgiving of my behavior right here. Mm -hmm. And that was his only note on it. And my editor made the same note. And I was like, "Okay, you're right. 
Um, but then he took forever to read the rest of the book. And I'm like, you've got to read the rest of the book. You get a lot better. <laughs> like, it's not all <laughs> just bashing on you the whole way through. It's a redemption um, story. Yeah, it it is in a way for both of us, uh-huh. I think, because we we both had our hangups with emotional labor. We both had issues that we needed to work through. And, you know, by the end of the book, we're definitely by no means perfect, but things are a lot better. And I feel a lot more hopeful for the future, not just for us, but, you know, for the fact that anyone could do this, because if we can, I I feel like anyone should be able to. And I think what's really insightful in your book is that as hard as you can maybe be on your husband in the first half, you always pretty much make it clear that he's one of the good ones, you know? (laughs) And so kind of going with that line of thought, like, I think it's really interesting that you point out that even men who consider themselves feminists or allies with the women's movement, that they often still don't take on that fair share of the emotional labor in the household. Could you maybe talk about that paradox a little bit? Yeah, and I don't necessarily consider it a paradox. I think that the nature of this work is invisible. And because of the way that we've been, you know, raised because of our culture, it's very easy for men to not see it. And it's very easy for women to not realize how much they're doing and not know how to talk about it. Mm. One of the things that came out of me writing that article was a lot of women emailing me and saying, I never had the words for this. I never had the language for this. And so I think that is what is going to make this change happen is the fact that we can talk about it. We can recognize it. Uh, so I don't necessarily think it's, you know, feminist men just turning a blind eye to something that's very obvious. Mm. I think it's not super obvious if you haven't been trained your whole life to look at this type of work and to value this type of work. So for the men out there that actually, want to learn this, want to do better, uh, what are some practical tips for men that are listening if they just want to kind of get started with this? So I think the best thing to do is to really try to take notice of what is going on. Watch your partner, see what they are doing, and uh, try to pick up some of that work without putting more work on your partner to ask, like, what should I be doing right now? What should I be doing right now? Because that's sort of the problem in the first place. And I know that seems to a lot of men like I'm asking them to read someone's mind. Uh, But really, a lot of this is very practical stuff uh, that if you just tune in and start watching and start noticing, you'll pick up on it very quickly. Mm. And that doesn't mean that you can never ask questions or that you shouldn't, you know, have conversations with your partner. I think it's been equal parts of both, uh, both my husband figuring things out on his own and feeling his own, you know, competence in this area of his life and us having conversations about emotional labor. Uh, Another really just practical thing, I think, is to read about emotional labor or listen to a podcast about emotional labor. (laughs) There are a lot of podcasts out there that cover this topic and can make a really good primer if you don't want to read the very intimidating book that says fed up on the front. (laughs) (laughs) That's great advice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. For women, though, that want to broach this subject with their partners, and again, I recognize that this is emotional labor in and of itself, how do you kind of start that conversation? I actually use the same advice for women. I think that a podcast is a great way to <laughs> to start the conversation. And I usually um, suggest the ones that have a male and female host, because I think those are the ones that tend to be more balanced and tend to make both sides heard. Uh, and I think that this is a really good suggestion just because it takes the pressure off of you to do all the educating um, on the first hand. And it's so easy. And also, if it is a tricky subject like this, I think it really lays the groundwork that this is not me attacking you or criticizing you, but I want to look at this cultural problem and how we can make things better. And it really shows that, you know, you're looking for a path forward towards a better relationship and not looking for a fight. (laughs) You know, that was definitely the case with me when I wrote the article. It came out of a fight we had about emotional labor because I was just in the moment and very frustrated. And that conversation didn't go well at all. 
Uh, so I think approaching <laughs> it, for, <laughs> approaching it from a different angle where you're really curious about how the dynamic is working in your relationship and how you can improve it. Um, that's really the spirit that you need to enter the conversation in. And I think that will take out a lot of that defensiveness. Do you have a show or podcast that deals with emotional labor that you would recommend? Um, so I really like, there's uh, one that I did on Dear Sugars with Cheryl Strait and Steve Almond. I think that one is a really good intro one. Um, also, Zen Parenting podcast uh, with... Todd and Kathy, uh, that, that was a really good one as well. And I think if you just type in like Zen parenting or dear sugars and emotional labor, um, they should pop up. Cool. Yeah. Well, we can link to those in our show notes too. So thank you. Oh yeah. So, you know, you've written the viral article and you've written the viral book, which I will point out that I brought it home and it was sitting in my house. And that week, my husband did so much around the house. Just can I just tell you how common that is? <laughs> I'm not is, saying that works for everybody, but it, I did notice a distinct uptick in like. So make sure it's visible. Yes, bring the yeah, book home. No, put seriously, it on your couch. Put it on a coffee table. <laughs> put it on a coffee table. I have heard that from so many people. It's a very, it's an intimidating looking book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, yes, I'm very just bold. You don't even have to start that conversation. Just put it on a table and, man, your house will be clean. Exactly. Um, so, you know, having done all of this, kind of what's next for you? What's what's on your radar now? You know, uh, what's next on my radar right now, I've the book has just published in uh, Germany and Sweden, and so I'll be getting to go um, to Sweden at the end of the month to talk about the book there and uh, I'm really interested to see how it translates internationally. Yeah. Uh, but after all of that, I'm really looking forward to looking deeper into some of the stuff that came up during the writing of Fed Up, which I can't really talk about yet because it's going to be in my next book mm-hmm. proposal. So that is what I'm working on now. I'm working on a second book. And I think it's very much related to Fed Up and to the research that I did here. It's not on emotional labor um, but emotional labor will definitely play a part in it. And um, the other thing that we always ask is, what have you been reading lately? Oh, I'm, well, currently I'm reading a lot of Harry Potter with my kids. And mm. I'm just starting The Testaments by oh. Margaret Atwood. Very excited mm. for that. Yeah. And then what did I just read before that? I read The Rip uh, by Mark Brandy, which was a, a really fun book to read while I was in Australia. It's a great Australian book. Uh, Three Women, though. If I'm going to like recommend a book here, Three Women, I read it last month and I cannot stop thinking about it. Hmm. I'm making my book club read it. It was just fantastic. Well, Gemma Hartley, thank you so much uh, for being on the Cook Memorial Public Library podcast. Thank you for having me. All right, that's it for our conversation with Gemma Hartley. Big thanks to her once again for taking the time to discuss her book and this topic with the library. The book is Fed Up, Emotional Labor, Women, and the Way Forward. At the library, we have it available in print and as an e-audiobook through our Hoopla digital service. Check this episode's show notes for quick links to the book and also links to the original Harper's Bazaar article that started it all, in addition to some of the podcasts and books Gemma recommended at the end of the episode. Don't forget to also check out the library's blog, Shelf Life, where library staffers post book reviews, genealogy tips, local history stories, and so much more. That blog can be found at shelflife.cooklib.org. And if you ever want to get in touch and leave some feedback, send us a message. Send those messages to webmaster at cooklib.org. And if you enjoy this podcast, please share it with those you love. And one of the best things you can do to support us is take a moment to leave a rating on Apple Podcasts. Those ratings really do help get this podcast noticed. We'll be back soon, but until then, keep reading, keep watching, and keep listening.